Right, hello my friends, let's just get to it because this is going to be a very different ups and downs because we have two nights to cover from Wrestle Kingdom courtesy of New Japan Professional Wrestling. If we do it like we usually do it, well eventually I'm going to have to go to the toilet because I'm a human being and you don't want to see that and why I record it, I don't know. But the point is, this is going to be like a quick cut, so now you know. Also, quick update for you as well. If you're looking at the ups and downs screen going, where's the New Japan images? Well, we're not allowed to use New Japan images because the last time we covered New Japan Pro Wrestling, they got all mad at us and we had a copyright claim and it was a whole thing. So would I like to include the images? Of course I would, but we don't want to get in trouble. Otherwise the channel will vanish into existence. I know some people be like, yeah, that's what I want, but you the weirdos, let's just get on with it. My name is Simon Miller, welcome to what culture wrestling and ups and downs, where we're going to do Wrestle Kingdom night one and we're going to do Wrestle Kingdom night two because it finished over here in the UK around about 25 minutes ago. So let's up those downs for the whole event. <laughs> Let's pop back to night one and the very first thing that made me go, <laughs> this is just a joy, is that Seema finally returned to New Japan Pro Wrestling after around about 67 years. And this is one of those wrestling things where someone will pop up and go, ha ha, I told you to never say never, because there was a point when everybody thought he was gone for good. It also saw him, Suzuki, Chase Owens and Yano proceed to night two of Wrestle Kingdom, where they were going to fight for the KOBW 2022 title, I suppose, whatever the hell you want to call it, the trophy. And yes, this was the traditional Rambo. But look, it's always stupid. It's always silly. So when I sit down, I go, I bet it's going to be ridiculous. And it is. So up. Show versus Yo was next. And given how much time we've invested into this program, this one kind of made my eyebrows raise up and me go, ha. Because not only was there a bunch of interference by Togo, it didn't work. Because Sho got a wrench, because why wouldn't you? It's a wrestling match, somebody give me a wrench. He went to hit Yo, Yo was able to get out of the way, he smashed Sho with the pump kick, and he got the one, two, three, and honestly, this must have gone 12 minutes. I mean, it was gonna tie into what was gonna happen 24 hours later, but this one disappointed me so down. And it was the same for the Bullet Club versus Tanahashi, Taguchi, and Rocky Romero. I'm not saying anything that others haven't said already, but it did end when Tanahashi got so mad at Kenta, he got a kendo stick and he thwomped him right on the head, and the referee saw it and went, okay, well, I'm just going to disqualify you. And there's nothing wrong with doing this, especially because on night two, we will talk about Tanahashi versus Kenta for the US Championship. But New Japan did a bunch of Road to Wrestle Kingdom shows, and this really should have been on one of those down. And to be fair, you could continue on this line of thinking when it came to Sanada, Bushi, and Naito taking on the United Empire. But for some reason, I found this one a little bit more fun. I think this was mostly because we did get some action between Jeff Cobb and Naito, which also was going to tie into night two. And Will Ospreay did get the win here after he hit the hidden blade. And imagine we had done anything else. He was going to be in the proper, proper main event. So I'm giving it up. And it's a good thing that that match was placed there in the card. Because if they had had to follow what came next... Well, they would not have been able to do it. Because we all know the story of Shibata. A few weeks ago, he just returned to New Japan Wrestling and he had a grappling match with Zack Sabre Jr. And even though strikes weren't allowed, it was still just like, how is this happening? Go and Google the injury that retired him. There was no way he should ever be able to return. And yet here he was in front of our eyes. So when he marched out here for his second match and went, you know those New Japan rules about, oh, I'm not allowed to take any strikes. Screw that. This is going to be a proper pro wrestling match. I sat there and just started to shake because I could not believe it. He was also facing Ren Narita. So what an amazing platform we gave to that guy. And even though Shibata hasn't wrestled properly in years, I suppose, at this point, he hasn't lost a step at all. And Ren completely held up his end of the bargain. Honestly, if you enter everything that's happened in the past, this was super duper special. I mean, it really is something you have to go and see. And of course, it finished with the most devastating move in all of sports entertainment, the surprise roll-up. Of course it didn't. If you bit on that one, you are a silly tamale. It actually ended when Shibata hit the PK onto Narita and got the pin. And now I have no idea what is next. Like, is he going to go after Okada? Is he going to go after Will Ospreay? Is he going to go after Kenta for obvious reasons? It has got me so excited deep down in my tootsie toes to the point it doesn't just get the up. It gets the golden up. And then Evil defeated Ishii for the never open weight title, even though I don't think Ishii defended it properly once. 
and he only held it for around about 56 days. It also had to follow Shibata, so all I have to say to you is nope down. I did kind of feel like Goto and Yoshihashi versus Zack Sabre Jr. and Taichi for the IWGP Tag Team titles fared a lot better because one, Chaos finally got the victory, which felt all nice and warm and fuzzy in my tum-tum, but also two, they did have the aforementioned buffer, meaning they could just do their thing. I mean, you could probably argue it didn't really feel like a Wrestle Kingdom match, but I enjoyed it up. And also, let's not even pretend when we did get to Takahashi versus El Phantasmo for the junior heavyweight title. Because they started at 900 miles an hour, I made sure I calculated it with my speed gun, and kept this pace up for around about 16 minutes. Desperado got the victory after he hit two Pinche Locos to retain his championship. And I swear, they must have had a 30 minute match down and someone went, oh sorry, you could only go half of it. So they went, well that's fine, because what we're gonna do is we're gonna take all the content and we're just gonna squidge it up. And I get that it wasn't for everyone, but in terms of watching wrestling and being like, bah! I thought it was pretty damn terrific up. And of course, our main event for night one was Akada versus Tagaki to see who was going to go to night two to become the real IDW champion. And I'm just going to say this. That was gibberish. IWGP champion. I'm just going to say this. Akada on the big stage does not have bad matches. Because look, all you need to know is this. It was so good that during the final few minutes, the fans started to go absolutely nuts, even though the rules in Japan when you go to a wrestling show is that you can clap and make a little bit of noise, but otherwise you gotta shut up. But they couldn't help themselves because good grief, it was good. Akada won after the Rainmaker to become sort of one half of the champions, because of course then when Osprey was out, he was like, ha ha, I shall beat you tomorrow. And when you are doing these two night events, you have to end night one with me going, hee hee hee, I can't wait. And I tell you, they achieved it. Up. So now let's move on to night two, which we will get into a little bit more. And there were a bunch of six man tags, which is essentially what WWE does when they get to WrestleMania and the Andre the Giant Battle Royal. It is very nice courtesy of the company. They just go, well, this is our biggest show of the year. So let's fit as many people as we can onto it. Honestly, there is not much else to say. I mean that our first proper match was for the IWGP Junior Tag Team titles where Robbie Eagles and Tiger Mars took on Taguchi and Rocky Romero, who also took on El Fantasmo and Ishimori. And never forget those last two deliberately called themselves the Bullet Club's cutest tag team. And as a man who is a big fan of goofiness in wrestling, I love it. It also all revolved around the fact that ELP may be wearing his now fabled loaded boot. And he was basically using this like a gun. Like he was running around with it. It was like, no, because they didn't want to get shot. I mean, the fear here that it was gimmick was absolutely real. And it took Eagles kind of distracting the man, which allowed Tiger Mask to finally smash him with the Tiger Driver before he started to get going properly. ELP was still all about his boot though, but Robbie Eagles cottoned on to this. So he made sure it slammed into Ishimori's face. And when that guy's face is like, oh, now I'm dead. The, all the other four guys came together. They removed the boot to see inside there was a bit of metal. So the ref went, all right, well, I've got three teams. You two are a bunch of dicks. You're out of here, but the match is going to continue. And I tell you, more promotions should do this. Soon after this, two Eagles was able to tap out Rocky Romero to the Ron Miller special. That is a good name in order for them to retain their titles. And I thought this was a very, very good tag team match. Up. This continued too, because next up, it was the Stardom Showcase match. And never forget how important this kind of stuff is. Over the last 12 months, Stardom has grown leaps and bounds. But when you put them on a position like this on Wrestle Kingdom, where a lot of people are going to watch, that's only going to help you expand more. And everybody here took this opportunity, pow, and smacked it out of the park. We also saw Nakano and Kimitani taken on Iwatani and Starlight Kid. And like I've already said, these four knew exactly what they had to do. And it was a pretty tremendous professional wrestling match. You also had some story in the sense that Iwatani and Starlight Kid have somewhat of an ups and downs relationship. I'm sorry, I shouldn't have said it. But they were still able to hold it together. And essentially what happened from here is that we waited, we waited, we waited. And everybody just did a bunch of dives. I mean, there was at least three in around 20 seconds and there may have been more, but so much was happening in front of my face, my body kind of shut down and well, I may have missed some. There was this awesome sequence too when Kamatani went for the Star Crusher, but when that didn't work, it triggered this battle to see who could do the most devastating move in all of sports entertainment, the surprise roll up. But when no one could do it, ha, huh, the tag klaxon went off and it was just move, 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 move. Finally, Kamatani realized, well, wait, this isn't working. So I'll go 
going back to my original plan. She hit the Star Crusher, she hit the Phoenix Splash onto the kid and she got the one, two, three. But like I will say for a few matches, there were no losers here. There just weren't because they went out there and they did exactly what they had to do. Go and watch Stardom. And then Suzuki became the KOPW 2022 trophy holder champion. I don't know what we're calling it. But I ain't gonna argue with Suzuki, cause it's Suzuki up. This carried across from night one. I've already mentioned the other contenders and it's hard not to mention them again cause I kind of feel like night one and night two were separate videos, but they weren't. And he got the win after he hit the gotch pile driver on Yano. Now, because he is Suzuko, he's like, man, now I'm gonna kill everyone. But Yano did one of his magic tricks that ended up with Suzuki being handcuffed to the top rope. He then continued to absolutely murder anybody because he didn't appreciate it. And I just love this man. It doesn't matter how old he gets, he is just so legitimate. And do not forget, there have been some New Japan shows, big New Japan shows over the past few years where Suzuki isn't even featured. And that is stupid. And just imagine what he's going to do in this spot. Somebody gonna get wrecked. And then night two hit a little bit of a roadblock. Nerds. Because it was Goto, Yoshihashi, and Yo taking on the House of Torture, and I swear, if you were driving along the road and you saw a signpost for this, it would read, take the next turn in for Shenanigans Central. And I don't mind that happening in wrestling, like you should always be able to have a little bit of fun, but when you're doing it on your big show and 24 hours earlier, you've basically done the same thing. Well, I don't really think it works. Even the commentator sounded a bit like, sheesh, this is not going to plan. How are we going to cover it? And of course, as soon as the referee was distracted, Show got that wrench again, which hadn't worked the night before. He clonked Yo right in the head and he got the one, two, three. So I get that's how we're going to continue this feud. It just didn't click for me and is getting it down. What was far cooler is right after this, Noah, and I mean the entirety of Noah, basically stormed New Japan and kicked off this invasion angle. It was even more nuts because the promotion had a show only hours before Wrestle Kingdom. So it was like, well, how on earth did they did it? I think I forgot that travel was an actual thing. And they called out Shingo here, who did arrive. And at one point it looked like he was going to rush every single employee of Noah. And then he looked up to the sky and went, no, this is a really stupid idea. And he didn't do it. Noah then promised they would overcome NJPW to become the biggest company in Japan. And I know the pay-per-view of Noah versus NJPW at the moment is basically a bunch of tag matches with a big signpost going, ah, this guy is going to lose. But I am a massive nerd. As I say, I do love invasions and we can make this work. We're at the start of the thing. We just have to make sure there's balance in the force. So I am gonna be a positive Pete. And I'm gonna give it an up. With all that said, I'm not sure that New Japan planned who should come after all of this on the card, which was a shame because usually they are great at constructing it. It just kind of goes big, big, better, better, smash, smash, so the whole thing goes like that. So when Sonada and the Great Okan followed, well, it wasn't the best placement. And it wasn't bad at all, far from it, but they slowed the pace down to such a crawl that any momentum you had just got out of that Noah angle kind of floated away. And I'll be honest with you, like watching two nights of Wrestle Kingdom is a lot. And I kind of just wanted this to finish. It was also a terrible night for the United Empire because the great Okan lost after he was hit with the most devastating move in all of sports entertainment, or at least a variation of, and I'm not kidding this time, and again, when we did get the one, two, three, I was a bit like, okay, cool. We can move on to what's next. Down. And on that note too, I just kind of feel like if we had done a proper big finish here, that would have worked wonders. And I get New Japan wants to protect the great Okan, but this is how I felt. Which is just as well too, because next up it was Naito versus Jeff Cobb. My word, it's getting it up. I mean, just go and watch it, because this video otherwise is going to be as long as Wrestle Kingdom was. And I was actually kind of surprised that Naito did defeat Jeff Cobb. But this is another one where everybody was the victor because they went on out there. And you could probably argue, especially when it comes to night two, this was the first match where you just scream because you're a bit weird. Ah, oh, Wrestle Kingdom is here. I mean, few are better at being the powerhouse in all of wrestling apart from Jeff Cobb. And Naito is just so believable because no matter what match he is in, there is always one moment where your stomach just goes, because it looks like he's about to kill himself. I mean, he took a suplex on the floor at one point and it just crumpled up like a piece of paper. There was also this crazy power bomb from the top rope, courtesy of Cobb, onto Naito, and if Naito hadn't worked over Jeff's knee for the entirety of the thing, he probably would have won. 
But that stands to reason. That's why Naito did it, because he was like, well, you may be a big man, but if you can't walk, you can't do shit. But there really was so much to this. It was so well worked. The pacing of it was flipping fantastic, and they just knew how to do the right things at the right time. I need to go away and think about it for a while, but this may have been the best match over both nights. Oh, I just love Jeff Cobb, and eventually he will get to the top of the ladder and he will smash it. Five stars. Whatever stars you want to give it, I mean, who cares? Which is kind of the same for Kenta versus Tanahashi in a no DQ US title match. I mean, talk about two guys that just went, should we kill each other? Yes. Given that these were the rules, the amount of weapons that were involved here, and I'll probably forget some of them, but we had chairs, the title bait was being used, we had trash cans, we had ladders, we had tables, we had kendo sticks, obviously, and in the early going, nearly all of that was courtesy of Kenta. He was so mad and he wanted to use his toys. The ace then decided to get even by smashing a guitar over Kenta's head, but seriously, this just belt to Tanahashi being laid out in the corner. Kenta found every single chair he could in the Tokyo Dome. He covered it over the ace and then he just ran and smashed him right in the face. I don't care if it's wrestling, I don't care if it's MMA, I don't care if it's you fighting with your brother Tom. There's no way to fake that. It looked absolutely horrible and it must have sucked. Amazingly too, this wasn't even the worst of it because after Kenta had smashed the ace through a table and a falcon arrow off the top rope, he set up this ladder that was so tall as the largest ladder I've ever seen in my life. And it was so big. Kenta had to put it together himself. And I've seen some people online go, oh, it's rubbish, he took too long. Uh-uh, brah. This was the most legit thing I've ever seen in wrestling. If you want to climb up that high, you better have a solid base. Before he could do whatever the hell he was planning to do, though, Tanahashi did get up and forget about any other ladder tip-over spot you've ever seen. This is the worst one ever, because Kenta fell and he went face first into this trash can and just busted his face open. But the fall itself, I was worried. I turned into his dad. I was like, well, that's it. He's dead. But somehow he got up. Fairly for him, though, he was then placed on a table when Tanahashi, 45-year-old Tanahashi, climbed to the top of this ladder and gave him a high fly flow. That was crazy as well. A part of me was like, what if that's not the three count? I am going to have to nerd out. But it was. Tanahashi becomes the United States champion. And this was flubbing brilliant. This was flubbing great. I don't know how Tanahashi seems to be getting better, even though he's getting older. And if you want to watch a couple of matches, watch the last one, watch this one up. This all left us with our main event, which was Akada versus Will Ospreay to find out who was going to be the real IWGP champion. And if these two hadn't have had a good match, I would have looked outside my window and seen the world imploding because I don't think it's actually possible. And sure, it was a lot like their other matches, but have you seen the other matches? They all really good too. They didn't keep it easy either because Will Ospreay booted Akada as he was diving over the barricade. And then Will looked around and went, oh, there's a lightning rig over there. Why don't I and go do some kind of flippy dippy doodah move off of it? <laughs> because this is just the universe we live in. But if I found out tomorrow that Will Ospreay wasn't human, I'd be like, man, I knew something was up. And then we were seeing power drivers, we were seeing Rainmaker's attempt, and we saw a drop kick turned into a power bomb, even though that makes about as much sense as two plus two equals potato. Osprey also followed that up with this Oz cutter for this crazy near fall. And that's when I realized, man, I'm gone. You just got to plug me in. Osprey has clearly mastered his R2 button presses as well, because he then reversed a Rainmaker into a Spanish fly, which is barely English. But then Akada was doing the same thing. I mean, he was hitting power drivers and then he smashed out the Rainmaker, but Will Osprey kicked out a two. And that got me that one. I went, oh! And realized I sounded dumb. We then balanced the books because Akada kicked out of the hidden blade, and this is when we started building to our finish. After around about another, I would say, 78,922 moves. But the point is, Akada finally hit one last big rainmaker. He got the one, two, three. He is now the official proper IWGP champion. And honestly, I am giving it an up. Go back to what I said about Akada. He never fails at big matches. Well, neither does Will Ospreay, and the two of them together is just chemistry. Naito was the guy to come out and challenge him straight away afterwards, as we always do this at Wrestle Kingdom, so we'll get to that soon. And I'm not gonna lie, was it the best Wrestle Kingdom pay-per-view overall I've seen? No, it wasn't. There was a little few problems, but a lot of that does tie into all the COVID issues. But when they had to hit, they absolutely smashed it. 
overall, it's getting it up. Now, please do leave a comment below and let us know what you thought about Wrestle Kingdom Night 1 and Wrestle Kingdom Night 2. Like the video, share the video, and subscribe. It's right there looking at you. Give it a click. Head over to whatculture.com and our social media channels. Follow us on there where we'll keep you up to date with all the wrestling news. And we have other videos, including ups and downs for NXT and Raw and SmackDown. Watch them all. My name is Simon for What Culture. Thank you for joining me as always. And I've watched way too much wrestling today, so now I shall rest my bald head. See you soon.